Hello, hello again to another Anga Kalaroyat, and today we'll be watching the history of tea from Kogito because apparently on the 10th of January 1839, first tea from leaves of indigenous plants of Assam, India, arrived in the United Kingdom. That's an approximation of the date. So let's just see uh, what's the story with the tea. This video was sponsored by Curiosity Stream. Get access to my video streaming service Nebula when you sign up for Curiosity Stream using the link in the description. Ah, here's the history of tea. In China, they sip it from tiny porcelain cups. Tibetans mix it with salt and butter. The Japanese whisk it during ceremonies. Russians add lemon, Moroccans add mint, and Americans add a dash of high fructose corn syrup. The Irish and Turks drink it by the bucket load while the call of the chaiwala is known across India, where they serve it with milk, sugar, and spices. It was tribute to Chinese emperors, sustained meditating Buddhist monks, and turned Britain into the deadliest drug British dealer bad. in history. Oh. So what is the history of tea? How has it changed our world? And what does it have to do with Jesus's Chinese brother? Well, let's the find what? out. Cool music. Cool music. Tea hasn't always been a delicious infusion of leaves and hot water. No, no. The first humans who lived in teas in native regions around Assam in India and the Sichuan and Yunnan provinces of China chewed tea leaves for thousands of years before brewing them. When did we start drinking tea? Well, we don't know exactly. The most popular legend places its origin around 2500 BCE. This handsome chap the mythical Chinese emperor Shen Nung was boiling some water to make it safe to drink when some tea leaves fell into it. Surprised by this new, tasty and energizing drink, Shen taught his Chinese subjects how to grow and drink tea. Huh. Drinking tea probably originated in Sichuan or Yunnan. It spread from southern China towards the north with the help of Buddhist monks. Tea had become their favorite drink as it could help them stay awake during their long meditations. The spread of tea follows along with the spread of Buddhism through China and other places in Asia. Tea in ancient China was quite different to modern tea. The Guangya is a Chinese dictionary from around the 200s AD and it describes how they made tea. They compressed all the dry tea leaves into bricks. To make some tea you just snipped a bit off the brick, mixed it with some hot water and then added some onion, ginger, salt and orange apparently. Tea wasn't an enjoyable beverage at this time. It was a bitter medicinal drink used to treat stomach aches, bad eyesight, skin diseases and sleepiness. During the Tang Dynasty, Chinese civilization reached never before seen heights. As art, culture and cities flourished, so did tea technology. Tea growing and processing methods improved the taste of tea. It transformed from a medicine into an enjoyable treat. Tea houses and tea gardens soon sprang up in cities and towns across the empire. Tea became a part of everyday life, from the emperor all the way down to the peasants. It was green tea that was the tea of choice at this time. The Chinese didn't start making black tea until around the 17th century. The Tang Chinese emperors began demanding that tribute be paid in tea. Peasants now had to grow tea along with their already heavy rice farming workload. Overworked farmers sometimes had to ignore their rice crops, and famine haunted the port of China while the emperor sipped away on the finest tribute teas. Yeah. The emperor, now rich with tea, got even richer trading it across Asia. The ancient tea horse road linked China's southwest provinces with Tibet. Vegetables couldn't really grow in the harsh Tibetan climate, but now they could mix yak milk, yak butter and salt with tea to add a little bit of plant fiber to their mostly animal based diet. In return, they gave the Chinese powerful war horses. Buddhist monks and traders moving along the Silk Road brought tea with them into Central Asia and into the Middle East. Tea had spread from Burma in the south to Siberia in the north, from Korea and Japan over in the east, over to Turkish, Mongolian and Russian merchants in the west. Tea arrived in Japan and Korea in around the late 6th century, introduced by Buddhist monks who were returning from their studies in China. During Japan's Kamakura era, custom of drinking tea reached the samurai. These intimidating warriors soon <coughs> fell in love with tea. They began hosting tea parties and spread tea houses and tea culture across Japan. Tea won a complete victory in Japan when the shogun of Japan, Sene Tomo, 
was suffering from a hangover so terrible he and everyone around him thought he was literally about to die. Until a Zen Buddhist priest brought the Shogun a bowl of tea along with his book on the benefits of tea. It cured his hangover and Senetomo became a tea addict and helped spread tea across Japanese society. Zen Buddhist monks would create an entire spiritual ceremony around tea, which evolved into the Japanese tea ceremony, which continues to this day. By the time of the Ming Dynasty in China, tea bricks had fallen out of fashion. Now, steeping loose tea leaves in boiling water was all the rage, and they developed black tea by fermenting tea leaves. And during this time, tea began to be traded with the Europeans. Oddly enough, there are really only two ways to say tea in the world. One is like the English term, te in Spanish, te in Irish, or le te in French. The other is some variation of cha, like chai in Hindi, zai in Russia, Subscribe. or chai in Turkish. Both versions come from this Chinese character. In Mandarin and Cantonese, it's pronounced cha. Where the so if a Polish language calls tea came from, I wonder. some variation of cha, then tea reached them overland by way of the Silk Road. But in Min Chinese, spoken in the coastal province of Fujin, the character is pronounced Te. Fujin is where 17th century Dutch merchants traded with China. The Te pronunciation spread to Europe by way of the Dutch. But the first uh. Europeans to reach China were the Portuguese, who traded through Macau, where Cha is used, which is why Portugal is the only Cha user in a sea of Te. The Dutch brought the first shipment of tea to Amsterdam in 1610 and started spreading it around Europe. Europeans didn't quite take the tea. The price was a bit too steep for what they saw as a bitter and medicinal drink. To them, it was only useful for its ability to vanquisheth heavy dreams, easeth the brain of heavy damps, and openeth obstructions in the bowel. The first tea arrived in England okay. in around 1645, but the English weren't keen either. They were coffee drinkers. That was until the Portuguese princess, Catherine of Braganza and Charles II of England married in 1662. Catherine loved tea. The first thing she asked for when she landed in England was a cup of tea. Spotting a potential opportunity, in 1664, the British East India Company gifted Charles and Kinda Catherine interesting, one though. kilo of Chinese tea. Soon, all fashionable society wanted yeah. to be seen sipping uh, it's tea It's only thanks just to like a Portuguese royals. princess. All English people love tea so much. ironically named Honourable East India Company was founded in 1600 through a royal charter from Queen Elizabeth I. It received a monopoly on all English trade with the Far East. The East India Company grew enormously wealthy and was an Honestly. empire in its own right. It could conquer Bumpy. territory, mint money, command armies, make war and peace and collect taxes. In the early 19th century, it had twice as many soldiers as the British Crown. In 1689, the East India Company started to import tea directly from China. Through the 1700s, the amount of tea being imported rose significantly year after year. Millions in Britain were now hooked on tea, and the tea trade with China was making the East India Company... The chicken hanging in there on the... Yeah, but yes. the East India Company found themselves okay, in look. hot water. China held all the power. Europeans were only allowed to trade at a single Chinese port, Canton. And China, huh. being the wealthiest place on earth at the time, had no interest in British goods. China only wanted cold, hard silver, which the British silver? were running out. Not even gold? So the Honourable Company devised a very cunning plan. Drugs. For centuries, people across Eurasia used opium, the plant used to make morphine and heroin, for its pain-killing and sedative effects. If the British could hook the Chinese on opium, they could trade that instead of silver for tea. But they would need access to land and labour where they could grow opium. So the East India Company began to colonise India. In 1757, the Honourable Company won a decisive well, victory for, because over of the tea? Indians at the Battle of Place, which gave them control over Bengal. Bengal, <coughs> the richest place in India, worth about 12% of the world's GDP was the proto-industrial, textile and shipbuilding capital of the world. Uh -huh. Within 15 years of the East India Company seizing control, 10 million Bengalis were starved to death. Jesus. And Bengal was deindustrialized and contorted into a massive opium field. The British drowned China with Indian grown opium. Opium was already illegal in China, but by the middle of the 19th century, 
one in every three Chinese adults were opium addicts. By 1840, the opium trade brought Britain revenues of 3.8 billion modern dollars, and that rose to about 22 billion by 1879. The infusion of cash into Britain from the tea and opium trade let them build a powerful modern navy, while an opioid crisis devastated China. In 1839, the Chinese emperor was fed up. He sent an official down to Canton to deal with this crisis, and that official seized 1.2 million kilos of opium and dumped it into the sea. <laughs> Soon, British gunboats opened fire on the Chinese. This started the first opium war of 1839 to 42. Not British warships devastated war. Chinese cities and armies. Opium addicted Chinese soldiers couldn't really put up much of a fight. The emperor was forced into a humiliating peace treaty. China would pay for the cost of the war and the destroyed opium. Hong Kong was handed over to Britain and the Canton system ended. The Europeans could now trade with China through Canton and four other ports. In a now bankrupt, war-torn and drug-addicted China, things began to boil over. In 1850, a rebellion against the Qing dynasty was led by Hong Xiuquan, the self-proclaimed brother of Jesus Christ? Yeah, I know. Didn't expect that. This rebellion yeah. killed about 30 million people. And during this rebellion, the British and French launched a second opium war in 1856. The emperor was again forced to negotiate and even more Chinese ports were open to foreigners and opium was legalized in China. By 1800, oh, cool. enough tea was being imported into Britain to provide one kilo of tea per person per year. That's about 600 cups. Tea had now become a staple of British life for all classes. British and tea were inseparable. The British Empire was riding a wave of tea, but they were keenly aware that it was the Chinese that grew it, processed it, and sold it to them at a lucrative profit. Why should China make a fortune off its own product when the East India Company could take that fortune instead? Uh -huh. From around 1778, the British had been aware that tea plants grew wild in Assam in India. Stripped of its trade monopoly with China in 1834, the East India Company finally started paying attention to native Assam tea. The company discovered you could make decent tea from Assam leaves, but they couldn't make Assam tea taste as good as Chinese tea. So back to the drawing board they went. Assam was a low-lying tropical region, but the Himalayan region had similar growing conditions as China's best tea regions. Assam tea uh... didn't grow well there, but if they could get their hands on some Chinese tea plants, everything would fall into place. Huh. The trouble was that the Chinese government banned Chinese citizens from sharing any information on growing or processing tea or trading tea plants with foreigners. So go. if the East India Company wanted tea for India, they were going to have to steal it. The thief would be Scottish botanist Robert Fortune, which is honestly like an excellent name for a person about to steal an entire industry. Mm -hmm. He was sent to China in 1848 by the East India Company to steal the finest tea plants and to learn how the Chinese manufactured tea. Fortune dressed up as a Chinese person because foreigners weren't allowed outside of the trading ports. Using this uh, disguise, Fortune would visit How tea farms work? and factories and learned that all teas came from the same plant, Camellia sinensis. Before this, the British thought different teas came from different plants. But Fortune was taught that the differences between green and black tea were the results of processing alone. Black tea was fermented while green tea wasn't. After years in China, Fortune learned the entire tea making process, obtained all the necessary equipment, sent back thousands of tea plants from China's best tea growing regions and somehow managed to convince six Chinese tea masters to go to India with him. Within years, India's tea industry was outproducing China's and doing it for a lower price. British colonialism and its tea plantations expanded into Burma, Ceylon, East Africa and other places where tea could be grown. During the last half of the 19th century, tea estates covered India, especially Assam. As the tea plantations grew, so did the need for labor. The search for cheap labor centered on Bengal, where Indian slaves were taken from their homes to tea plantations in Assam. The conditions on these plantations were horrific. Uh -huh. Owners refused to provide enough food, disease was rampant, clean water wasn't provided, and child labor was common. Today, Assam is one of the most underdeveloped and poor states in India, and is home to several separatist movements. 
Nowadays, over 13 million people are employed in tea production. Workers still often work long, difficult hours for low wages on tea plantations, where they often have to live. Poor working conditions and disease are still extremely prevalent. But luckily, we live in a world where the East India Company, or empires, no longer have a monopoly on the tea trade. A fairer wealth distribution across the tea supply chain and better practices are possible. Organizations like Fair Trade and the Ethical Tea Partnership help small tea farmers receive fair prices for their products and monitor living and working conditions among other issues. Today, tea is the second most popular beverage in the world after water. Global consumption of tea is forecasted to reach 297 billion litres by 2021. Hmm. By choosing to buy sustainable and human-friendly teas, the lives of tea producers can be improved significantly. And over the last 20 years, conditions on at least some of the tea plantations have improved due to these efforts. When Robert Fortune snuck those plants out of China, he couldn't have imagined how large the tea industry would become. His adventure in China was fascinating, and I wish I could have discussed it in more depth. There are pirates, bad disguises, and many, many mistakes. But I feel better knowing that you can see his entire adventure by watching Tea T War, T The Adventures of Robert, Robert Fortune, Fortune, over on Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a streaming video service that gives you access to thousands of documentaries. They even offer exclusive original documentaries featuring great minds like David Attenborough, no. Stephen Hawking and Ron Swanson. You'll get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month if you sign up over at curiositystream.com forward slash Kavita. And use promo code Kavita. So it's not available anymore. So guys, what do you think about it? Do you drink tea? Are you, do, do you prefer coffee? So I drink actually both of them, but I drink tea more often, I think. Although, not that much of a black tea anymore, more like a mint tea person, no, nowadays. And yeah, but that thing about so many people died because of it. So many people went through such a horrific treatment and all that, it's just, uh, I don't know, such a, such a small thing, but it's just, in the end, it's just, just not tea. It's money we're talking about, isn't it? It's just terrible. It's like, yeah. Kind of like a first time of a, what's that called? The, the business espionage? Just, oh, disgusting. I'm gonna say it. So, I'm gonna grow my own minty, I guess. Okay. So, did I ask, do you drink tea or do you rather coffee? Or do you drink both? Or you don't drink any of them? Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you very much for watching. And I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.